Today is January the 11th, 2010, and this is the start of an interview with Mr. Carl Blackford at the RSVP offices of Catholic Services in Lacombe, located at 15945 Clinton Township, Michigan. Mr. Blackford is 86 years old and was born on May 13, 1923. He currently resides at 37568 Ingleside, Clinton Township. My name is Sylvia Kaminsky and I will be the interviewer and Phil Denham will be the videographer. Mr. Blackford, would you state for the record the branch of service you served in? I served in the Army Air Force. It's not recording. No, that's okay. Right. Okay, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you were born and and something about your family. I was born in Windsor, Ontario. <clears throat> of American parents. My father had been sent to Manistee, Michigan, put the roof on put them with a brand new Morton salt plant. At the time, it was the biggest salt plant in the country. Uh, they pumped water down, pumped brine up. <clears throat> they met my mother, and they got married just before they finished the job. Next next place where he was sent to was over in Windsor. It created problems until just a few years ago. Uh, nobody wanted to agree that I was an American. <laughs> and so I got a, pass or a, a passport that states on there that I was born of American parents, that I am a U.S. citizen. America. Actually, how about brothers and sisters? I had one brother and one sister. Were you the um, where were you? Were you the oldest? I was the oldest. Okay. Um, did your sister try to boss you around? They say ladies kind of no. try to know if she, no, she, she was didn't. okay. Okay. No, my mother died when I was six. So my grandparents. Now, where did your grandparents, you lived with your grandparents after your mom died? Yes. And where did they live? In Manistee County, okay. yeah, on a farm. Both my grandfather and grandmother came from Sweden, met in Manistee, got married, raised nine children, oh. plus three of us. Graduated from high school in 1941, spring. Of course, as we all know, 1941, towards the end of the year, Japanese Pearl Harbor happened. And from there, of course, we were registered for the draft. And I decided I wanted to learn to fly. So you, you enlisted then, you weren't drafted, you enlisted? I enlisted. Went to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Enlisted in what I thought was the Army Air Corps. May have been at that time that they were changing it. Um, passed the test and started going through the Cadet Corps. Well, you find out in a hurry that you aren't necessarily going to be what you want to be. I want to be a pilot. Lucky. Passed all the physical tests, the vision tests, and everything, and the written tests. How was your basic training? Was it tough or? Basic training uh, to learn how to march, I suppose. <laughs> they sent us down to uh, Miami Beach. Actually, when I enlisted in Grand Rapids, in November, I think it was. Uh, I swear you in right away as a private. In my case is that you're not even, you just called a private. They sent me home because there wasn't room for another class right away. They called about the first week of January, I was called up. 
and had a horrible strep throat. So on the way down, we left from Detroit, Michigan, in cattle cars, but that's what they seemed like. They were 100 years old, it must have been. By the time I got to Atlanta, Georgia, I was really, I had a big high temperature. So they dumped me off in a hospital. And uh, about that time they discovered sulfur. And I remember getting these powders. I'm sure it was sulfur, sulfur of some kind. Immediately better, almost immediately. Yeah. You got there just in time? I was there for a week. Went on down to Miami Beach by myself on a train. Got there just in time to be paid. <laughs> Good time. Payday. You line up and paid you in cash too. You know. To Had you ever been uh, away from home before that? Any length of time? Or? Not really. No. Mm -hmm. How were your instructors, your drill instructors in your... Well, we had a corporal, and I tried to remember his name, and I can't. It's okay. He was very good. Oh. He was good at uh, various marching maneuvers. And he could bring squads up, you know, set a squad off to the left, squad straight ahead, squad to the right, and then everybody meet as they're marching along. He's counting. Oh. You know, he's got it figured out so that you can meet at a certain point, which you do. Okay. Um, do you, was there anything in particular that you remembered about your fellow soldiers? Did you make friends with them? Do you still hear or are you in touch with any of them at all? I'm not in touch with any of them right now. Mm -hmm. For all I know, and we did correspond for a while, Bombardier and I. Okay. To, you're running out of things to say. Sure, that's right. Now, how was the food? Well, food was, in the Air Force was tremendous. That's what they say. You know, I used to hear that, you know, oh, Army food, Air Force. But everybody says it was good, good food. Okay. The best, best meal is one breakfast that you had before you went out on a mission. And you had real eggs, <laughs> bacon, anything you want. Wow. Of course, you ate quite a bit because you knew you might be gone for 10 hours. Okay. Um, when, did you get an assignment, and, and a particular assignment, and how were you trained for it? Did you get to pick what you wanted, or was it assigned? Number one, when, they, when they, I started out at Dar Aero Tech in Albany, Georgia, and open cockpit airplanes, steerman's, single engine, and from there I went to uh, multi-engine. Actually, from there I went to basic, which flew a little bit higher and faster plane. But uh, they uh, do it two months at two, two months at primary, two months at basic, and two months at advanced. And they advanced the <coughs> time twin engine because I knew that I'd always had trouble doing Immelman's. Immelman, I'm sure, is a maneuver that you've seen me slide down, come up, and up here you got to flip over. And uh, quite often I fall off in a spin. You can't do that. Not if somebody's on your tail shooting at you. That would be a deterrent. So I made up my mind that, hey, I didn't want to do that. I stepped out of the frying pan, got it, I mean, into, into the frying pan. Went to the multi engine. There they just shot at you. That's just, just shot at you, that's all. Well, an aircraft. I didn't fly combat until late. I was too young. Not at the time, not too young. But Right. Graduating is the yeah. 1945, we were wrapping up the war. My first mission was 
during the Battle of Bulge. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I actually kept the note of various missions all the way through. Would you like to read something from your diary of the mission? Mm -hmm. I can. I can read the first mission. Well, I, there's something else I should say first. Okay. We trained in B-24s okay. after graduation as a pilot and officer in Savannah, Georgia, at Chatham Field. So initially, we were all through B-24 groups, which is a high-wing mile plane, not a low wing like B-17. <coughs> and it's like the difference of flying it was like driving a big truck in an automobile. P-17 was much easier to fly. Anyhow, we get to the base, Polbrook, Britain. Freddie, Freddie Horns was a pilot. I was a co-pilot. God, they made, they made a mistake. We got a report to the colonel, which we did, Colonel Carraway. I can remember he said, well, what can I do for you, boys? And uh, well, we think there's been a mistake, Colonel. We'll be 24 pilots. I said, that's all right, boys. We'll show you how to fly them. <laughs> so, you can do anything, first mission, I can say, was at, at uh, Marysburg, Germany. We were briefed at 4.45 in the morning, took off at 8.50, got in formation all right, flew number two in a low element, uh, class of uh, mission is made up of 12 planes, three, 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 and we were down the low element, that's the toughest spot to fly. If they slow down a little bit up there, you might maybe trying to keep up. You're, in effect, you're giving a little bit more throttle. And suddenly you're, you're going ahead of them, so you've got to cut back your speed. You almost reach the point you're loaded with bombs and stuff. You have to be there very careful that you don't stall. And, uh, so that was our introduction, anyhow. We got had a runaway prop just as we entered France. Went into the target was number two engine, had 17 to 15 inch half, half something, half uh, forgotten. It's okay. Uh, um, on that particular engine, number two, we ran at 2,500 RPM, 2500 RPM for the rest of the Flak of front lines inaccurate, flak of target medium high, and to the right. In other words, we were lucky. We feathered the engine when we got back to France. Number one fuel pre pressure dropped, very about that. half. But the engine was conk, I said. And all in all, worked like heck. Were you, uh, so you were really in the midst of uh, all the shooting and the, uh, the flak and the so on and so forth. Um, I can tell you about the most interesting and most dangerous one. Okay. All of them were dangerous. Well, Some were more yeah. so than others. Yeah. 25th of February, 1945, we were after the marshalling yards, the switching yards, in Munich, Germany. And they come in from the north on a bomb run.
have 90 guns in range. Shooting. I've, I've meant that they have 90 cannons for the action. Mm -hmm. We were hit. Let's see, I say it. South of Strasbourg, Strasbourg, and over the target. Thought we'd had it. Number two gas tank shot out. And our bomb bay is open. We're on the final bomb line. And it hit the back of the number two engine, which is on the left. Number one, two, three, four. Um, and it tore out the gas tank, too, so the gasoline come pouring up through the bomb bay and into the Sperry Ball, which is down below. remember his name, but he had quite a bit of trouble crawling out of it because he had a piece of, a little piece of slack was kind of rattling around inside and trying to avoid that. Our, our radio operator was Sergeant Park. He reached, you know, naturally for his parachute pack because that was laying down at his right foot picks it up. And it torn it to, to bits. You know, there were two, two of us, well there may have been more than two, but there were two badly damaged, our, our ship and another ship. Pilot of place, Sandell's crew. Sandell was the pilot. He, he had it worse, much worse than we did. Could only maintain 5,000 feet. We were able to pull it down until we got to France somewhere. Actually, you, were, you had instructions to, if you were able to, to get to field X where they had repair facilities so that pick up a repair plane if you were lucky and get back to your base right away. We weren't able to do that, but we luckily crossed over a, a 26 feet. We controlled France for that point. And, uh, so we got up heading towards this, this base and started going and then made a decision that, hey, we, we aren't going to be able to make it. We won't have enough fuel. We got permission to land there. So at that point, <clears throat> they loaded us into a truck and started heading towards this field, which was probably, I don't know, must have been 50, 60 miles or maybe even 100 miles away. That night, I remember, <clears throat> we, we stayed in a town, I think it may have been Cambrai, and they put us in a warehouse that had been used as a uh, German army barracks. Mm -hmm. So they were poorly constructed. Uh, uh, two deckers and <clears throat> no lights, nothing. It got dark pretty early back then. And, uh, I crawled in a top bunk, Fred crawled into the lower bunk. They had pads. They had three pads. That was their mattress. Of course, it was better than boards. And, uh, uh, I'm up in the middle of the bunk sometime in the middle of the night. I think broke and landed on top of Fred. <laughs> the problem is, you didn't have any lights. No flashlights. You don't carry flashlights around with you. We stumbled around, found some empty bunks, and crawled in, slept some more. Next morning, of course, we're hungry. And we're waiting around for the, the uh, truck to show up. And Fred and I are walking around the town. We saw somebody by with, on a bicycle with a loaf of bread under their arms. There's a bakery around here. Pretty soon we could smell it. And it made us hungrier. So we went in and tried to buy a loaf of bread, you know, a big long loaf of the loaves must have been that long. But it wouldn't sell us one. 
naturally, they, they, were, they didn't have enough food for themselves. So we didn't argue. But at the time, both Fred and I smoked once in a while. A pack of cigarettes would probably last me at least uh, three weeks. I reached in my pocket to get a cigarette, because it does deaden your hunger. And pulled this pack out, and I saw this clerk's eyes. One clerk like that big around, you know. So I just handed her the pack. And she took the pack and she sold us a loaf of bread. Bad habit paid off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of it that way, but that's right. It did. Wasn't much of a habit back then. <laughs> I guess not. Okay. Were you ever injured? I never got a scratch. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. No one was injured on our plane. And we had, mm -hmm. I counted 67 holes, some of them as big as my head. But, uh, nobody got a scratch. Okay. Um, now, I can tell that you do. Um, did you take any souvenirs? Do you have any souvenirs? Well, not really. I have what? some pictures. Okay, what else do you have here? Yeah, these things. Are... These were after the war. We flew over to Germany and just looked at some of the, some of the things we accomplished. You know, wow. Hold it up. You want to just hold it straight up? Yeah. yeah. That's good. There's four pictures here. One might be cool. church standing. Need a magnifying glass to mm -hmm. see it here. Okay. Everything else was had no roots. Mm -hmm. Or were completely demolished. Do we have another one? Is it the same thing? It's the same thing. Okay. Some of them show railroad yards. Mm -hmm. What's the newspaper you have there? This was the, the, the newspaper called The Stars oh, and Stripes. Yeah. Your brother probably had that too. Mm -hmm. He yeah. probably had some too, so I saved a couple. What's the date on that one? The date on this one is Saturday, April 21st. Year? 1945. 1945? Nuremberg Falls. Allies close in on Nazi redoubt. Berlin admits Reds are eight miles away from Soviets. Uh, Nuremberg was where um, Hitler had his Black Forest hideaway. Hmm. The army was trying to take it. Yes, my brother did have uh, some of those everywhere. He, he was pretty good at sketching things, and they used to have him sketch different things, and then they were, you know, they would appear in that. And he ended up um, in, a, in a unit that designed um, camouflage because he could draw, you know. But yeah, I, I remember that now. Was he in the Air Force, too? No, he was in the Army. He was in the Army. Um, and what's the yank? Was that yank? Hey, that's just, this is a tissue of yank. Oh. I have several of this an hour. Yeah. Looks a little younger there, huh? Yeah, he was quite a bit younger. Of course, we thought he was an old man. Huh? Of course, you thought he was young. Yeah. <laughs> we, we thought anybody that was 30 years old before. <laughs> yep, that sounds very right. How old were you? I was 21. Oh. Well, you were pretty old too, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Older than a lot of them. Okay. All right. And um, what what's that? The big picture there. That's a, the one that's in the frame. You, I want to see them all, but I just I was looking at that framed picture. That's in the chair. chair. Yeah. yeah. That's a neat picture. Can it's you pick beautiful. it out there? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's a neat, yeah, neat. Can you? Good. <clears throat> Myself, okay. Frank Fuller, our navigator, Freddie Horns was a pilot. Okay. Here's, a, here's a picture of yeah, me in 
that's a Stearman airplane open cockpit in primary training. Here I'm, I'm in Pulbrook Field, and somebody snapped this picture with my camera standing next to what must have been a 500 or 1,000 pound bomb. Here's a picture of Fred and I in Savannah, Georgia. That's a good picture in the middle, too. They have plenty of the bombs. This, this is the, more or less what it looks like when you're up there and you're dropping your bombs. Wow. The bombs cover down below. Can you turn it toward the TV? The camera? Yeah, as soon as he, he's trying to explain who's who there, so um, then when he's through, you can just turn it toward the camera. This is a memo about uh, landed in France, 25th of February, 1945. 64 black holes I counted in the ship. 130 gallons of fuel left. Number four uh, manifold pressure acting up. We'd already feathered number two, so we were having trouble with number four. Anyhow, we landed in France, and we, we got back to our own base on the 27th by picking up a repaired plane, a piece of junk. And we wondered whether we'd make it or not. And uh, the next morning, we went out on another mission, 28th. Can you hold yeah, that you up? You could just hold it up a little bit camera. more. Yeah, yep. there you go. That's good. You were pretty good looking as no wonder you got all those good looking kids. Huh? And so was your wife. Couldn't you couldn't uh, couldn't fail. So many pictures. Sorry, I moved down here to show uh, these these were pictures that we you usually took a picture after you got back to your home base. Took another picture of the whole crew here. So how many members in the crew? Normally you'd have pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator, and, and one, two, three. You have two waist gunners, nose gunner, and a tail gunner. I can remember Zamola cut was a tail gunner. One time they were tracking us, going in on the bomb, just like shooting a pheasant. Yes, so you move ahead. And back there screaming, I don't blame them. He wants us to do something, to do, but you can't. The bomb on you just flies straight up. What else do you have there? I have my discharge papers. Uh -huh. I have a discharge. Actually, as an officer, you don't get a discharge. You get a certificate of service. Okay. So I've got that, too. That means they can grab you back the way they want to. There was the enlisted record. I didn't even get a good conduct medal. Oh. Well, now, do you want to tell us why you didn't get a good conduct medal? He just never gave us one. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, I will we'll take that answer. Okay. Because you were always good, right? Yes, I was. I knew it. I knew As a that. cadet, I was actually very, very good. I didn't want to be washed out. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. And what about your officers? How were they? Were they pretty good to you? The guys that ran you all? In overseas? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I only knew two of them, Lieutenant mm. Colonel Ball, he was a jerk. <laughs> uh, this will go into the Library of Congress. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, right. That's better. <laughs> the reason I say I think he was a jerk is because <clears throat> his superior officer did a good job. Uh, but we all flew back because we thought we were going to Japan. And he insisted on sitting in the co-pilot seat. I was the co-pilot. So I stood up all the way from Britain to Iceland, where we stand, where we landed, refueled and slept, and on to Goose Bay, Labrador, 
in Goose Bay Laboratory. We were heading down to Mitchell Field in New York, but we didn't make it because weather closed in. We spent a few days in Maine. Um, trapped at the base. We naturally we wanted to get out. Bangor, Maine, you, you stayed there uh, in that phase. I didn't, I didn't let you get away. It didn't matter whether you were an officer or a business man. Well, I had to stay there. <clears throat> you did manage to see a little bit of the world, didn't you? Well, France? From the air. From the air, that's true. Okay. Well, since you were most of the time in the air, you didn't have ch did you have any chance to things, see things like USO shows or any kind of entertainment, or how did you entertain yourself? Not over there. No. But if we had bad weather, I'd usually go to Nottingham. <laughs> You had to make your own fun, huh? Maybe that's why you didn't get the good conduct medal. No? Okay. Were, were, you, were you based in France or in England? Britain. In Britain. England, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when did your um, service end? How did your service end? How did you come out of the Air Force? Were you discharged? Well, I, I basically, and I actually I was discharged at Fort Sheridan in Illinois. What year? 1945. 45. And okay. I had heard that I got to understand I was a farm boy. Hmm. Uh, never got off the farm until the Army. And uh, so I was relatively uh, innocent, I suppose. <laughs> Major Gaylord and I were both discharged at the same time. He, uh, he was very good. Officer, he'd gone through two tours, probably just one about 50 combat missions. At the time, I'm pretty sure he grew up on a farm, too. Uh, I noticed that he listed as his home address, I think it was the Drake Hotel in, in, uh, in Chicago. So, how many missions did you fly altogether? I flew 17 missions. Was there like an upper limit that you would fly and then? Normally a, a tour would be 25 missions. I think they initially started out in 43 or 30, maybe more. Just like the army does today, if they need you, they keep you. Did you fly every day? Well, not from Britain, no. Because I failed to mention that after the after the 28th, which was three days after being hit over Munich, flew this next mission. We came in and then they made us squadron leaders. So the, at that point. Bombardier's got to have more trainings. So we fly, even if you had a day off, we'd be out flying practice missions with the Bombardier. And usually, we flew every time there was a mission. Um, what was it like and when you got back home? Uh, what did you do after that? Did you go back to school? Did you find a job? What did you do when you got home? I got home, I still was on terminal leave. So, actually, I had, because of that, I had more time in the Army than my cousin, who thought he had far more time than I. And I never bothered to tell him. One of the reasons is, that, number one, I had extra time because the day I enlisted in Grand Rapids, that counts. And I went home and spent another three weeks for uh, being called. And I had this terminal leave, so I had like 33 or 34 months of tour in the Army. And he had about a month less. Yeah. He never could understand it. I probably told him why. <laughs> but you asked me what I did. Um, uh, a lot of the guys in the Army had pilots and volunteers and had one or two years of college. 
know, I knew that we could go to school on the GI Bill. So at the time, my brother had been discharged too. Started Michigan State, and I was still in, actually in the army, too, where I had a so-called rupt. This is this is American Legion pen. I had a ruptured duct pen that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and you're discharged. Okay. Did some of your experiences, or how did some of your service and experience affect your other affect your life at all? Did that? Well, I'd say the the whole whole time that I was in the Air Force affected, affected my life, it opened my eyes to other possibilities. Okay. I never dreamed that I'd, that I'd, let's say, go to college. What was your degree in? Bachelor of Science in what today is called food. Called what? It's called food, food science. Oh, right? okay. At the time it was okay. manufacturing processes of Dairy products. Um, now, how did you um, happen to meet the, uh, Meet my wife? Mm hmm Blind date. What? In or out of the service? Actually, I had a very good friend, Larry Freeman, who I met. Uh, he was also going through the same dairy school. Oh. And uh, George had decided, I said, last year, Fourth year, I said, "What are you going to do, George?" He said, "I'm going to law school." I said, "Yeah, what makes you think you're going to get into law school with a bachelor of science in dairy technology?" <laughs> he says, "Don't worry, I'll get in." We did. We took, we had to be interviewed, etc. At Michigan, and the same question was asked of him, and he simply says, "Well," he says. Dairy companies need lawyers too, don't they? Mm -hmm. I'm equipped to do a better job representing them than anybody yeah. else. They probably got them in. That's good. Is there anything else you'd like to add to your, yeah. about your experiences? He's the he's one that uh, I, I came to Detroit. And I was working at the time for Michigan Dairy Equipment Supply and sales traveling Ohio. Up and stopped in to see George. He said, well, we're going out tonight. I don't know why. He said, but I, I think that uh, Priscilla, his wife, get you a date. That led to the thing. Good choice. Okay, anything else? C can, I, can I go back? Because I, I think I missed something. Uh, you you enlisted in uh, early of, early 42? Oh. November of 21. It must have been 44. Oh, okay. No, 43 it had to be. Okay. And, uh, you, but you graduated high school? In 41. 41. 41. Okay. So how did you, how did you miss getting drafted between the time you graduated high school and, and when you enlisted? Well, I graduated from high school. I was 18. Until 17. Okay. In no special way. My first job was working at a foundry at 35 cents an hour. And moved up to the machine shop, didn't know anything about them. But any of the equipment they had there, but they probably assumed that. Did a good job down in the country. We need guys up here, so I managed to ruin things that I was making, <laughs> making for about three weeks or so before they caught up with me. They said, put me on a J and L lathe, and I was making washers, thick washers. And uh, of course, you're supposed to, <laughs> you're supposed to measure them, and I did measure it. My measurements weren't proper. <laughs> Nobody ever showed them. Never. They didn't. They were too busy to take time to show me how to operate this, this thing. So 
kind of make scrap, there's no question of it. <laughs> so then they put me on a grill press. Well, anybody can do that. <laughs> Scrape. We were making uh, we were making frames. Foundry was pouring frames, big heavy duty frames for 50 caliber bullet presses, shell presses, big shells. So I remember, I ended up in the scraper to make these big brass brass. Sorry, I had a stroke in July. <laughs> they, were they were they for the shell casings or? No, uh, yeah, make the casing. Right. And they may have been also used to press the bullets in. Ah. Uh. That's what I did until that <clears throat> I lost the contract. I wanted there was an period where I didn't need any. They laid us off. I thought at the time I'll go down and join my brother and work at Willow Run. Believe me, 24s. Get down there while I was too close to being drafted. They wouldn't hire me. So I did put up insulation in some of those very black you know, buildings they had for the people that were coming up. A lot of people came up from the south, different, different uh, states, and uh, worked that until I said, yeah, let's go join the Air Corps. I went to, to Grand Rapids. I was just looking at your biographical data form, and here it says you received the Air, Me Air Medal to Oak Leaf Clusters. And then the World War II Victory Medal. So you got a couple medals, huh? Well, something else. Yeah. The Air Medal is, they gave the Air Medal to anybody who supplied five missions. Oh, OK. Well. And then the Oak Leaf Cluster would mean that you supply five more. So if you okay. get two, with 15, actually, I noticed in the records I'm supposed to have a third one. OK. I don't have it. So. OK. Can you share that uniform there? Oh. Oh, okay. I'm oh, oh, fine like that. Just if you want to just turn around and point to the uniform, that's fine. Oh, oh this is a dress uniform. Not, not really dress, but it's a uniform. And you've got pink trousers. Pink and, trousers? And, yeah. All these trousers are pink. So oh, that's <laughs> just. Well, you can see why if I. Ah, okay. Uh, Good looking. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Uh, I see the air medals. Yeah. Yeah, the air medal with the. Yeah. One, only one question. One must have knocked off here. Two, here's three. These are battle stars. Uh, not battle stars. Our battles. Battle of the Bulge is one. Okay. Two battles, and then probably three others. Okay. That must have been a pretty intense experience, the Battle of the Bulge. Um, well, we weren't we on the ground, so thank God. Yeah. Did you fly a lot of missions during that time? No, not really, because we're. The whole Britain was socked in just like the whole of Europe. They couldn't take off. Although there were times we did take off with maybe 200 feet of ceiling. And then <clears throat> the rest of them could come out maybe at 30,000 feet. And we, we Fulbright was near the town of Peterborough. And Peterborough was a little bit north. And to the 
west of uh, London, and north and east would be Wash, a big bay. And most of the 8th Air Force would, would group over this area. So you've got 36 planes taken off from your own field, and 36 planes from a field that might be 15 miles away. So they're loaded in this cloud cover with planes all over. By the instrument, the clouds so thick that you can't even see your wingtips sometimes. It's kind of hairy. Um, so, when you flew a mission, how many planes typically flew with you? How many planes? Yeah. Usually there's 12 in each. Uh, the group would be 36. Okay. The squadron would be 12. And and um, how many how many would come back? Most of us came. Most of them came back. Was it? Would you know? You know, as you were flying, that that you lost a plane in your squadron or in your group, or would it be something that you wouldn't no. find out until you got back to base? You would, normally, you wouldn't find it out because you kept your, you weren't be talking on the air for a number of reasons. You had to have an emergency to say anything. And of course, it wasn't passed on to the whole group until we got back. Actually, I think the only mission that I could recall where, where they lost two planes was the one that I, one of us, one of, one of them I was in. By the time you were flying, the, the tide of the war had pretty much turned in the favor of the Allies? Right. Yeah. One mission was down in Bordeaux, France, with submarine pens. It was a milk one, and there was nothing to it. Just flip it over. Excuse me? You can just flip it I over. I know. Okay. You, how did you find out the war was over? What was the reaction when you when you heard that the? I can't remember. Are you talking about in Europe? Yeah. <laughs> we we had uh, gone on Flat Creek down way down to. I trained down the way to the southern of Britain. We get there and the telegram or whatever they had done came through and said to return to the base immediately. The war is over. We will be going to Japan. So we just we never got our flag cleaned. You know, it was warm down there. And, uh, so we got back on the train, went back to the base, and just sat around there for another two or three weeks. Because on our side, 
I can't remember his name. He was never really got to know him. He was a captain in the BOQ next to us. Where sometimes you, if the weather was decent, you might go out in shorts and try to get a little sun. I'm out there and put a blanket on the ground. I'd see him there once in a while, but uh, talk about irony. The captain, he'd probably gone through two missions already. Two, two, not missions, two, two uh, tours of duty. 50 combat missions. On the way back to the U.S., somehow or other, the instruments must have been bad in his plane because they, there are no mountains to say, we wouldn't call them mountains, but there is a, a big hill someplace about 2,000 feet. And we we're heading towards Iceland, and they ran into this hill or mountain, whatever you want to call it, kill them all. Oh, jeez. The other mission I flew was after the war was down to Lentz, Austria, where they had, they probably had a big concentration camp, but what we were after were, we picked up Frenchmen who had been captured and for forced labor, who flew them back to France. We went up again. We, we had a special field to go to, <clears throat> but we went out of our way and used the Eiffel Tower as a pylon, circled mm -hmm. it. Okay. Okay. Can I ask you a few questions, sir? Um, now. You, I understand you were the co-pilot. Did you and the pilot share uh, flying duties? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, so you fly for eight, nine hours. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were when you were hit, uh, when the fuel tank was hit, was that from ground fire? Yes. I was flying at the time. You were flying at the time. Picked us up like this. He left the other on too, trying to keep us from falling on our back. I figured if we, if we landed, if we got over on our back, we were done. And of course, he didn't have, most of it was manual back then, you know, cables that operate the various controls. So it was, it was hard work. And, and the captain will let, let you, since you were flying, he let you keep flying through the crisis. Oh, absolutely. Wouldn't, wouldn't think of changing at the time if you right. screw up. <laughs> now, um, were you not able to, to drop your bombs? So as soon as we got straightened around a little bit, we did drop them. don't know where they went. Uh, what, what was the target? What was the intended we didn't target? Have a target. We Target was the railroad yards in Munich, okay. where we were hit. Okay. It was a big transfer point for trains going all over the rest of Germany. Okay. So, uh, it, like I said, it picked us up probably, I don't really know how high. And we started falling off very rapidly, like this. This, by my work. He was busy uh -huh. feathering the engine on number two and uh, notifying the rest of the crew that took their parachutes on and so forth. And uh, so he certainly wouldn't have tried to take control at that point anyhow. It uh, takes a lot of strength. I was bigger than he was. Probably lucky that I was flying at the time. And not only taller, thicker, but I grew up on a farm, so I was fairly muscular. Fred was not a weakling, but I know he wasn't nearly as strong as I was. 
I was happy that I was flying very nicely. Mm -hmm. So at, the, at that moment, everybody on the plane was busy. I'm sure they were. They were being thrown around, too. Now, were there, were there German fighters after you, no, too? No. There was no fighters up there? No, no. I, I never saw I only saw two fighters. One was way down at 5,000 feet below us. The other one, I can't, at this point, I can't remember where it was. Probably, probably we were going into Germany someplace, and some damn fool came up. To, <laughs> Mm. We had fighter escorts too. Mm. You had escorts. Yeah, P-51s and P-47s. Mm. Now I, I apologize. Was it a B-24 you were flying? No, B-17. Oh, it was a B-17. Okay. Now, is did you have to drop your bombs? Could the plane not land? Fully loaded? You could land fully loaded, but we weren't going to do that. We didn't have any idea how bad our damage was. Oh, so you wanted rid of the bombs? We were very upset, uptight about landing even. Okay. We knew something was wrong with it. We had to crank the, the wheels down by hand, and we were afraid that the wheels would collapse. Rather the bombs because we just didn't, you know, <laughs> didn't want them. didn't want them in there. Right. Didn't need we the weight either. Didn't care where they landed. They probably landed in some poor farmer's field. Or hopefully not in some house. Um, there is one mission that I'm not very. I've thought of many times. Dresden, Germany. I had a friend in Canada, came from Germany, and she, she asked a friend of my wife's too, Crystal's mother, why did we go in and bomb Fred? Mm -hmm. uh, the real reason was they, they just wiped it off the face of the earth. The British came in and dropped fire bombs. The next morning we came in and dropped bombs. Psychological to want to avoid it. I'm not finding an argument with that. The fact that they dropped bombs on the sails and make me, on purpose, to make me happy. You think of things like that. Mm -hmm. How many hours after you were hit? Um, on the Munich run, did it take you to get back to that base in France where you were able to land? Maybe two and a half. Very stressful two and a half hours. Well, we are worried about not having fuel. And we were happy we were still alive. I can remember when we did land, ground force individual was out there. He was looking at the planes and looking at the holes. He said, I'm glad I'm on the ground. Don't hit me the airplanes on your time. Huh? Yeah. yeah, they are. <laughs> I, I, I just one more question. I apologize if right. you already answered it. Um, when when Germany was defeated, uh, were you anticipating having to go to Japan? That's what we thought you were going to do. Yeah. But you never you never did bomb Japan. No. Didn't send us over. New York, they sent us out to South Dakota. It was, it was uh, a field, I can't remember the name of it. It was wheat harvest time. 
when they, you know, when labor was a problem. Back, people were still stocking, shocking, we call it shocking, uh, grain bundles. They were cutting with a binder, which would cut the grain and tie it on a bundle. And come along later, would pick these bundles up and kick them on the ground. So is that where you were when you heard the atomic bomb was dropped? No, I was down in Jackson, Mississippi. They sent us down to that field. I graduated from Columbus, Mississippi. And I heard out here the little graduation booklet. You were out of the service by then? No. no. When they dropped, no? I graduated from an engine. I'm sorry? When I graduated as from uh, for, uh, from advanced. Oh, okay. okay. There were four, four, one, two, three, four first lieutenants probably came in from uh, they wanted to fly. And then one, two, three, four, five second lieutenants who went through the same course, advance. And then the rest of us are aviation cadets. There's one. I never counted them. They don't number them. small print indicating guys who graduated and then became second lieutenants or flight officers. And have you ever flown since the military? <laughs> no. Well, 1945, I went out to the airport in Manistee. Rented a Piper Cub, showed him my license, I had a multi engine man license. With, and I still have it somewhere, but it's, you know, it's worthless. And uh, he looks at this license and he says, Well, I better go with you for the first thing. <laughs> it's a little bit different than a Piper Cub than a four engine. Chuck hole, and I didn't know how they were. Whether there were any holes in that field that I wanted to land in or not. Mm -hmm. It was the last time I flew. I very honestly enjoyed flying, but when you got to remember, you're up to here. Yeah. You never had an interest in uh, flying for a commercial airliner? No, I didn't even think about it. Number one, in 1945, I I suppose if I'd been more aware of things that were going on, I would realize it. I, I just didn't see that we were going to have the commercial airlines like we have today. It was part of the thing in my mind. Thinking back at it, I probably used to have part-time jobs. When I was going to college, I should have gone out to the airport and got a job, sleep the floor or something. I did. Stupid. Is there anything else to share on that table, Dad? 
No, not really. Oh, here's a yes, I do have. One time I came home on leave and they gave me a war ration book. <laughs> oh, seen them, there's a bunch of stamps in here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I had to use them for gasoline. And I had my old 1935 Dodge Coupe. And we used to go to the same gas station. So I pulled in there. Who was his name? Mr. You didn't use your stamps? I didn't have to use them. You can get as much gas as you want. Because you were, you were a veteran. Do you have a funny story to tell? I told him. Find a loaf of bread. The only other funny story, and I didn't record it in the so called diary. Mm -hmm. um, he clung to our target, dropped our bombs, ran away back home, flew over some city, I can't remember which one, and started shooting at us. So I reached around and went hit my, my helmet, which I often used it, kept right, right in back of me. And of course the top turn gunner and engineer is right standing up there in the top turn. And his pack, pack was a little bit on the lazy side once in a while. He probably drank too much beer. So he had to urinate. Guess what he picked to urinate in? My helmet. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Instead of his own. Well, his own wouldn't. So, and, and there's no room for it. my helmet. I used to crawl right inside it. Tuck the flak suit around me. And it just, I feel like it was right inside that damn thing. Now, did they, did they supply you with the... Uh, like chocolates and cigarettes and uh, a hand weapon in case you were ever down in enemy territory or anything? Well, we all had 45 caliber uh, pistols. And as soon as we got overseas, they told us to put them in your trunk and don't even think of taking them. If you have to parachute out and you got your gun on you, they'd probably kill you. That's what they say. I had heard that some pilots were even given a cyanide pill uh, if they were shot down. I don't know. Never heard of that. That could be the earlier part of the war. Well, thank you very much. You've got quite, quite a little collection there in the, the, the diary. Um, quite, quite a treasure for your family. Believe it or not, I've never been out to Willow Run. I keep saying I'm going to go out there and see if they want any of this stuff, some of it, at all. Sure. We've got a B-17 out here. They have to be 24 too. I don't see them flying it, so they must not be, must not be in very good shape or they haven't finished overhauling. But you do see the B-17 once in a while. All right, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Can you hold it up for a moment just so we can yep. see it better? And the stamps? The stamps are points. There's so many points mm -hmm. for the stamps. 